Good evening. <laughs> now this is uh, such an intimate gathering this evening. I want all of you to just come closer. Um, I'm Joanna Marsh. I'm the Senior Curator of Contemporary Interpretation here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and it's a pleasure to have you with us tonight for this special program that's organized in conjunction with the exhibition Jean Davis Hot Beat, which is currently on view in our third floor galleries. Um, and before I get to introducing the program and our speakers for this evening, I want to just remind everyone to silence cell phones and other devices. Um, and Tonight's program is going to be divided into sort of three different parts. Um, each of our speakers um, will talk about their work for roughly 15 minutes, um, and then we'll all share, the three of us will share the stage um, for a conversation, followed by a short question and answer period um, with the audience. And if you would like to ask a question, we have microphones set up in the aisles of the auditorium so that um, anyone who's watching via webcast can hear your questions as well as the answers. Uh, from our speakers. Um, so without further ado, here in Washington, D.C., it's often our inclination and habit to look back retrospectively at the artists who comprised the Washington Color School, um, commemorating their accomplishments and celebrating the era of artistic innovation uh, in our city's history. In fact, the American Art Museum just this past January uh, had such a program bringing together a lively panel of curators and critics who talked about the cultural landscape of Washington in the 1960s. Tonight, tonight's program takes a broader, more forward-facing look at color field painting, examining instead the legacy of uh, the movement and its influence on a younger generation of artists beyond the boundary stones of Washington, D.C. Uh, we're joined by uh, two artists this evening, Polly Affelbaum and Odili Donald Odita, um, who are going to share a bit about their work and the influence of color field painting in general and Jean Davis specifically on their thinking and practice. So I'm going to introduce both artists now and, um, and then invite them one at a time to um, come to the podium. Uh, Polly Affelbaum was born in 1955 and received a BFA from uh, Tyler School of Art at Temple University. She's exhibited widely since the 1980s, um, and most recently her work was the subject of a one-person exhibition at Otis College of Art and Design in Los Angeles in 2016 and at the Worcester Art Museum in 2014. A selection of Polly's prints are actually currently on view just around the corner at the National Museum of Women in the Arts in an exhibition titled Chromatic Scale, which, as luck would have it, opened today. Uh, Affelbaum is best known for her sprawling floor-based installations that fuse traditions of painting, sculpture, craft, and installation, and deploy a wide variety of media, including dyed fabric, shredded paper, wallpaper, and ceramics. Her process of staining and dyeing materials is vibrant and improvisational. Since the 1990s, um, Polly's work has progressively grown in scale and complexity to encompass site-specific installations and immersive environments that continue her exploration of color and multisensory experience. In 2014, she created For the Love of Jean Davis, an ambitious intervention um, into uh, the, the architectural space, uh, and that inspired the title for this evening's program. Uh, Polly's artistic practice and sensibility are informed by a sweeping knowledge of the applied arts, art history, and popular culture, which, which infuse her work and serve to locate it within a specific formal and cultural context. And now Odili. Odili Donald Odita was born in Nigeria and lives and works in Philadelphia and in New York. Uh, he received an BFA, excuse me, an MFA from Bennington College, Vermont, and a BFA from Ohio State University. Uh, and since 2006, he's been a professor of painting at Tyler School of Art uh, at Temple University, and that's just one of the many sort of intersections between Polly and Odili's work um, and their, uh, their careers. 
Odita has numerous one-person, uh, excuse me, has had numerous one-person and group exhibitions, both nationally and internationally, as well as completing major site-specific installations at Yale University, Virginia Tech, the Savannah College of Art and Design, and uh, recently the U.S. Mission to the U.N. in New York City. Over the last 20 years, Odita has developed a signature abstract style that recalls hard-edge painting of the 1960s. His wall installations and paintings on campus pulsate with brilliantly colored geometric forms that intersect and collide, creating dynamic patterns that explore the potential of color to, to trigger memory, emotion, and reference contemporary human conditions. It's my pleasure now to welcome Polly to the stage, and she'll be followed by Odili. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. And I'm not a Washingtonian, but I'm a Philadelphian. And um, Jean Davis was somebody whose work I saw early on in my life as an artist. And hopefully I'm going to push the right button. And in um, 2012, I got a, Google, um, a Rome Prize fellowship. And it was interesting, one of the shows I was asked to do when I came back was an installation in, um, at Tyler, where I'd been uh, gone to school. So I had been working with the stripe, and seeing the show upstairs was incredibly um, informative. It's just really beautiful work. And was, had been working, these are prints that I made, and prints, you know, very intuitively, but also with systems of color and stripe. They're woodblock, and each uh, stripe is hand-colored. So um, before I went to Rome, I was asked to um, participate in um, a show in Paris um, with, by, it was organized by Dior. And they asked 14, 14 17 women, to do whatever they wanted to honor um, Dior. So I decided to take the system of color um, and take Dior's logo, which was the um, uh, houndstooth, and put them together. You know, one of the things, reading upstairs, every, every quote they have of, of Jean Davis and what I've kind of noticed about Jean Davis, he's a contrarian. And I think as an artist, that's something that I, I've always been too. And he says, the only place to go in art is too far. And so I've worked in all these different ways, think of myself as a hybrid. So this was kind of a rug that was woven in Oaxaca, hand-woven, hand-colored. And you know, it was curious, because I had been working on the floor and installation, but um, this was a, a kind of different way of working. So um, this was in the process when I was in Rome. And then what happened, there you can see the prints being made. And um, each stick hand colored and then put into a jig. Um, so here are some of the kind of variations. And seeing some of the paintings upstairs, it was really interesting. I always thought that um, he didn't follow patterns, that Jean Davis, there, but Looking at the paintings, it was interesting to see some of his kind of groupings. We were moving the sticks around, and we noticed that um, we were getting these different color blends. So it was really, really interesting. Usually, I'm not so systematic. We started out just all the colors, and then these kind of are much more su systematic. They're Hudson River um, inspired by the landscape and the Hudson River painters, but also Jean Davis. So this is one of the later ones. And um, I was also blending color. So getting a rainbow roll, also a split fountain in printmaking. So I was thinking about um, Jean Davis. And when I came back, uh, Tyler, my alma mater, said, we'd love you to do a show. And a year in, in um, uh, Rome really had me looking back at at art and looking at different art and different histories. And what I loved about this, I remembered um, 
I was, it's, it's, it's kind of funny that I was giving a talk at Tyler and this, came, this image came up and I've always shown it. It's something, you know, this kind of hybrid, this taking painting outside the frame. I was um, mentioned that I was in 1996, I was in a show at the Corcoran, the Corcoran Painting Biennial, that was um, painting outside the frame. So that's something that I thought a lot, a lot about with the installation and the hybrid. So Life Magazine, the wor 1972, I think, maybe somebody in the audience will correct me, and it was the world's largest painting. And I thought, what a wonderful thing. And in front of the art museum, this was called Franklin's Footpath, and also it was um, the beginning of um, outdoor art projects and kind of public art projects. So it was a very important project, and I, I probably saw it. I don't know if I saw it. I definitely saw the, you know, it, it made an imprint one way or the other. And so what I decided to do is um, do kind of honor, and that's for the love of Jean Davis. I think artists, you know, we, we, we love to, I love painting, and it was just be, so beautiful to sort of channel Jean Davis into the work. Um, world's largest painting, I thought that was really kind of funny too, but it was really interesting that so many people, and even I would say to friends, Europeans, do you know Jean Davis? And they knew Bridget Riley, or they knew a certain pain painters, European painters, but they, and certain American painters, of course, they know Pollock, but a lot of people didn't know Jean Davis, and so I really wanted to um, make an installation and sort of honor and bring back the kind of history of Jean Davis. So what we did is we did some research. Um, we got the original um, paintings that I think were in the art museum. I contacted the Philadelphia Art Museum and they um, hooked us up. But it was interesting too to even look at um, photographs and because the color from the original to even photos of the installation were really kind of um, varied a lot. And so you enter the gallery, at first you see For the Love of Jean Davis, and then we did a little historical um, piece about the, the show. And what was so interesting to me is that we had people who had or um, originally painted with Jean Davis, the painting, and then we found the curator, he was still alive, and he gave us sections of the road. So it was just a really wonderful process to kind of look back. And um, also at this time, Sam Gillian had a big canvas on the outside of the um, art museum. So all of these, the um, I think it was called uh, the, Oh God, I forget what the, the Public Works Foundation will come to me, but it was really amazing how, for, how forward thinking they were and bringing painting outside and into the world. So my piece, um, so this is um, me and that's my assistant. And so we decided to, um, for the love of Jean Davis and um, really wanted to keep Jean into the, into the mix. So these are kind of the working drawings that we did. We um, looked at the paintings, matched them on the computer, sent the drawings to Oaxaca, Mexico, and all the um, rugs were handwoven and woven in Mexico. So taking something and kind of bringing it inside and reinterpreting it. So here you can see, it's a very large space. And um, here's the wool that was hand dyed. And it's interesting, the women are the colorists, they dye the fabric and the men are the weavers. It's a very physical and here you can see, it's just, it, um, a, it's, they're Zapotec Indians, it's a tradition that goes back 5,000 years and it's kind of amazing. I've never been to Oaxaca. This is all through the computer, but um, had started working years ago, had the opportunity in 97 to work with the same weaver, and then at 20 years did the uh, Dior project, and then now these projects. 
So this is a picture of the rugs and the wallpaper. So we had wallpaper made, we had um, four rugs, each about oh, um, 13 feet by um, 25 feet, so you can tell the scale is huge. And um, it was an amazing experience to, I ha only see the work when it's shipped, and so um, we unrolled the rolls and the wallpaper made in Philadelphia. So I had never done anything this scale or this complex, and it was just a, and what I love about it too is, is that Philadelphia was so happy to see it. It was a part of its history, and, and going to Rome, for me, it was interesting to think about place and think about history and think about painting. So here you can see it. And there, what we did is, we wove Gene Davis into the rug. So he's there. And so his footprints, his paint, um, so if you look at the photograph, if you go back, that's, we wanted to include Gene Davis in the process. So there you can see my feet, my um, assistant's feet, and, um, and Jean. So that's my assistants. Um, so what was wonderful, I was given a young um, intern as part of this process, and he also did a project too about um, Jean Davis and the process. So, so I'm quickly going to show you, this was another um, um, installation that I did, but it was for the love of Morris Lewis. And I know they didn't, um, you know, it, I listened to part of the conversation that was held about Was the Washington School, and I think they said as soon as they called it a school, they obviously didn't have um, that much to do with each other, but it was interesting. So I was asked to do an installation which was under the title of Three Graces, at the at Everson Museum. So they own a really beautiful Morris Lewis and they wanted all of the three artists for us to work with the collection. So I said I'm going to weave a rug for their rug, I mean for their painting. So this was for the love of Morris Lewis. What was interesting is in that area, golden paint, which all the painters, um, they, <laughs> Use. So one of the kind of breakthrough um, staining techniques was with golden paint. I'm not sure if it was called golden paint then, but it was in the area um, of the Everson. And it's a really wonderful um, paint factory which you can um, visit. And it's also a socialist paint factory. They gave the paint um, to the workers. So also if you ever, this is a tip, if you ever need um, have any questions about acrylic paint. But so this area had that kind of, so I, I, I did a little research on Morris. They were very happy. The painting, like the paintings upstairs, were cleaned. The community was really excited because this museum, um, its brutalist architecture, was um, uh, really proud of their Morris Lewis. And they collected these paintings, a lot of the 60s painters. I am paid on the building, and the painting of that time was the Colorfield painters. Um, here you can see. So I painted the stripe. I also, it has, they have a great collection of ceramics, and I reorganized their ceramics color-coded. So the footprints, here you can see the ceramics. So one of the wonderful things about this work is, yes, you can walk on it. And for me, the kind of irreverent, um, the kind of hierarchical place the painting has been, I love this idea of bringing people into my work. The footprints, I had no idea that people would do this. And the kids were, who, one of the classes that came, they were sort of wearing the same colors. I don't know if they were told or, or if it was just a coincidence. But um, I don't know if Morris Lewis would like this, but I hope he would. It, it really, I think it's, it's, you know, it's a backhanded compliment. I do love Morris Lewis also. So just to end, because um, the color stripes have, this is a recent project, the billboard, that's called Any, Any Dream Will Do. 
and it is the stripes behind, but I have the animals because I need the animals right now. They might be coming, they might be going, but the background is the kind of wonderful stripes that I think for me represent a whole idea of joy. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, the talk this evening. I'm glad that everybody was able to avoid the rush of the what the baseball players or, or the basketball, ba basketball players <laughs> on the other side of the street. But thank you for being here and for um, your time here this evening. Uh, first, I want to read my uh, artist statement to you to give a preface and to focus my work in the specific way that um, uh, I've been working through it. Um, if we can get the Okay, great. So you can see it too. Uh, third color, third space. Color itself has the possibility of mirroring the complexity of the world in as much as it has the potential for being distinct. The organization and patterning in the paintings are of my own design. In the paintings, I continue to explore metaphoric ability to address the human condition through pattern, structure, and design, as well as explore it for its possibility to trigger memory. The colors I use are personal. They reflect a collection of visions from my travels locally and globally. This is also one of the hardest aspects of my work as I try to derive the colors intuitively, hand mixing and coordinating them along the way. In my process, I cannot make a color twice. It can only appear to be the same. This aspect is important to me as it highlights the specificity of differences that exist in the world of people and things. What is most interesting to me is a fusion of cultures where things that seem far away and disparate have the ability to function within an almost seamless flow. This fusion I seek is one that can represent a type of living within a world of difference. No matter the discord, I believe through art, there is a way to weave the different parts into an existent whole where metaphorically the notion of a common humanity can be understood as real. I want to expand upon painting to reinvestigate its inherent means as well as contribute to its ongoing intellectual future. My commitment to painting has come with a growing understanding of quality and beauty that can be found through painting and how beauty, when actualized, can communicate a complete consciousness. Here is now. At this time, I'm still interested in how my paintings can look like the scrambled reception from a television set, a disconnect from recognizable imagery, and yet give one the sense of a familiarity, familiarity located deep within one's own culture. And our overly Mediated reality, I'm all too aware of television in its doctored way of transmitting the information we consume on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, a type of sociocultural information that can be successfully influenced, that can successfully influence us in the ways that we think, act, see, and feel within our environment. It is my intent to mimic this format through painting, but in my way, the subversion I wish to conduct is a type of communication that speaks of Africa. It is evident that African culture is interwoven within Western culture, and yet the continent continues to exist as a region denigrated in the mind of the entire world. I wish to rechannel the negative thinking around Africa and speak from the center of its presentness and expand upon what I know and understand about the history of this amazing and unquantifiable place. Now, the reason for me to read this text is, is to really preface the work that I make. And it's important for me because this is just like what any artist does, is to um, really um, create a type of ownership over what they make in their practice so that they can say that it's speaking from their um, vantage point, from this ground from which they're standing, from their own perspective. And this is important for me to think about it when I think of Gene Davis because, in fact, his work was about avoiding and escaping interpretation. His work was seen, it was, is, is experienced in a way that everybody is trying to figure out what it is, what it means, what codes may exist within the colors, for example. But what it does is that it seems to be living forever. The show, we were just talking about it earlier, how fresh the show looks. Uh, cleaned, of course, but looks as fresh as, as, as um, you know, a brand new day. So for me, to be able to read this text to you is to be able to define my work in ways in which I understood the work would be subsumed 
which would be this type of Ameri it's this American type painting, which could be called color field or hard edge abstraction. And there was a lot more to the work than just um, those issues. Um, here's a picture of uh, this group of people called the Zaria Rebels. They were actually students uh, at the um, Zaria College of Art and Science and Technology in northern Nigeria. And uh, they were called the Zaria Rebels because they actually wanted to change the curriculum from one that was very Euro Eurocentric to one that would speak towards their indigenous stories and their indigenous life. So they were actually challenging the art curriculum and that's why they were given the title Rebels. And this was not a phenomenon in, in Nigeria alone, but in, all over the continent of Africa. Uh, and in particular, we have um, um, right here. Let's see if that works. Is it? Okay, that's my dad, uh, Emmanuel Okochukwudita. And these are other artists are really um, uh, they're just stars of modernist Nigerian painting and sculpture. Just um, they're the foundation of what we can see as understand as you know uh, modernist Nigerian art, and um, I take my experience from from them. So this is the first painting I made when I was in um, when I left graduate school. I went to Bennington College, and I worked with Sidney Tillum and Philip Walford and Pat Adams and the history of color field painting and abstraction and the history of modernist painting. And it was a really tough time for me to actually uh, engage all of that because on one hand, I love all that work. But on the other hand, I, like you heard in my text, I had this sensibility and this sense of being that I knew wasn't exactly um, fitting square peg into this um, space. So um, when I was at school there, I was going through a lot of experiments thinking about postmodernism, uh, modernity, we were discussing a lot of Greenberg. Uh, Sidney was um, going through his rants about uh, abstraction and Greenberg and uh, figuration and everything else. But he was a really great person to work with. And so I was painting with everything and everything in my, in my canvases. Just the canvases were a dumping ground for material and detritus because I wanted to speak about entropy and so forth like that. And essentially, I realized the argument I had was, it was, it was about painting and the history of painting. So when I came to New York City, I, I got rid of um, everything in, that, in those paintings. And I essentially wanted to get naked with painting. Um, I made this painting thinking about the things we're thinking about then, um, wallpaper, um, decor, the picturesque. And I was confronted by the computer. And this is, again, early 90s, you see 1991. I had this job in New York City working at this uh, uh, computer um, CAD company, computer-aided computer -aided design company uh, called Stitch King, where we digitized logos uh, to be printed onto t-shirts. And this is really the beginning of it all. I was working with a program called uh, 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 Photoshop 1 and uh, <laughs> Adobe Illustrator 1.01. <laughs> Nobody knew what we were doing at all. And uh, they just saw computers and flashing lights and just said, go to it, you know. They just let us go. But I was learning a lot about space and thinking about space in the computer relative to space in, in the canvas and space in the painting. And uh, was just marveled at the screensavers, this idea of thinking, of, okay, the computer right now, we have it super flat, it's super beautiful now, but this was this giant box. And uh, you had the screensaver, and space was going 2,000 million miles back into the screen. And you'd step, you just, was, it was just amazing to look at the screensaver, and you'd step around and look at the back of the box and think, you know, this little box, well, big box, is making all this space. And this conversation I was having with painting and computer and thinking about it was coming after this conversation of um, cinema. That was the conversation that I was dealing with in school, cinema. So the computer and this, this, this dawning light of the computer in that space. So I was thinking about this idea of 
information just running up the screen, like a cinema screen, like the text at the end of a film, and thinking about the idea of multiple grounds in the way that I grew up. I grew up Nigerian in America, in this Nigerian bubble, hearing the conversation at home, hearing the conversation at school, and then trying to mix the two together and trying to bring the two together in a way that made sense. And it was really, really difficult. So with these paintings, I was initially thinking about how can I make a space, multiple spaces exist as one. And so I figured out for myself, let me just play with the idea of grounds. Let's say that this ground foundation, the firmament, the ground we stand on, is blue, dark blue. Then the reality from that ground is everything else. But what if we had a different reality, a different ground, a different position of thought? thinking perspective. So the ground becomes yellow. Then we have another painting. What if the ground is orange? Well, then we have another painting. Then what if the ground is the light blue? And then a fourth. So this is the beginning of just kind of thinking through this space, these chevrons that, in a way, play off of African textile patterns and alpha striping. And just thinking about this idea of inclusion and multiplicity in the, in the way that I was growing up in America, not the kind of America that I got from TV alone, but all the different Americas from comic books, from my parents, from my friends, from school, and so forth. So when I got to New York City, I was working with a couple of people, uh, Okwi and Wazor, who started his magazine, Nka, Journal of Contemporary African Art, and Ike Ude, who had his fashion magazine called Erud uh, Magazine. Uh, Erud is the joke, like, like Erud story, or Erud house, or Erud dress. So it was kind of a joke uh, uh, title for the magazine. But through these um, group of people, I was able to really explore my Africanness, my Nigerianness in a really specific way relative to contemporary art. It wasn't just something that was put to the side like it was in school, and put to the side like it was in graduate school and, and coming into New York, but something that I could really address straight away and center. So with the magazine, we were really trying to bring this idea of contemporary art, or rather African art, contemporary African art, art, African art made by Africans today in a contemporary context, to be able to actually understand that this work doesn't have to be relegated to prejudices or um, perspectives that are limited only because one doesn't have the experience of travel or one doesn't have the experience of reading and research to know that this work is existing and being made alongside all the others. So we did that, and this is the kind, and the kind of names you see up there are, it was the was the approach and the ambition we had when we did this project. We were going to do it in a way that was to say that if you didn't know who these artists were, well, there's a list of books that you're going to have to read very quickly because these artists are just as important as the ones we always read about in the art world. And the names you see in the other fashion magazine, that was the kind of world we wanted to engage in that level as well, to be able to talk about access, approach access, and being equal players in the center stage. So um, I was working uh, through painting up until from, uh, with those early paintings up until the 1992, then I stopped painting because I just was thinking, painting's not working, I'm just not feeling it, I'm not getting a sense of what I could do with painting. Let me engage what's happening in the art world in the 90s, it was identity politics and I was really going into that sort of space and thinking about the idea of what it means to be a a self or to be a person in this uh, cosmopolitan city of this time, a citizen of the world at this time when the sense of the global was becoming more paramount and effective. This piece was coming from this small little oh, photocopy piece I made and was turned into this billboard at the second Johannesburg Biennale that Oak Wind was or curated. He went on from the magazine, starting this magazine, I worked with it from issue two to become the curator of the second Johannesburg Biennale, then eventually Documenta, and then Venice, and, and so on and so forth. So there, was, there were outlets that we, we pursued and, and ends that we achieved in the, all this work back then. So I was going through this work, making this stuff, thinking about um, off-center, center stage, position, positionality, uh, the per interpretations and perceptions. This, for me, is the, is the American question of authenticity. And um, eventually I got back to painting. In 1998, I was this artist residency called Art Oh My, and I started to paint again. 
And coming back to some of the earlier things that I uh, was uh, thinking about and working through that I thought maybe there's another life in all of this. And it happened with this painting, wall painting. Um, I understood something when I made it to scale bigger than my head, made it to scale bigger than a television set or a computer when I could actually have my body become part of the space again. That's when I understood something about these paintings that I can start talking about spaces. And these are the kind of spaces that are, were in my head, spaces that were of memory, spaces that were of my past, and spaces that were coming from all my traveling. Because I did quite a lot of traveling as a kid, not only physically, but in books. Because we understand with the computer that travel is virtual as well. So these paintings started to become a little bit more complex. I was thinking about the notion of the edge of the canvas, the idea of reality, the idea of modernity. Modernist painting, modernist painting, the reality is the center and up to the edge and back to the center again. Modernist painting has no reality outside of itself. This is what modernist painting is. This is something that I wanted to go against, to think about and go against. What if these colors expand from one side of the paint canvas expand and hit the other side. Do they come back again as the same thing? Like the, they reach the end of the world? Or is there the potential for it to continue to expand beyond what you see there, what you don't see there, rather? The periphery. What's beyond the periphery, or what is the third world? What's beyond the periphery, or what is the other? The space, the body you don't see. So this is kind of the thing I was trying to think about quite a lot in the, through these paintings and with this motif. So I started to continue to explore the potential of space, color, rhythm, and pattern, and going beyond the notion of wallpaper, because in those earlier paintings, there was always the idea of a repeat, as if acknowledging on a certain level this idea of modernist painting that ends only to repeat itself again. So, um, I'm going to show just a few more pieces, talk about a few more things, and just zip right through the imagery. Uh, this was called Mirror. This is a piece I did, uh, my first wall painting, as, as I would call it, let's say. Um, it's pigment on, on the wall. It was in Poland in this exhibition space. Uh, we, were, we had a group exhibition. I saw a mirror. I knew I was going to do this on the wall. I just knew I was going to put this black pigment on the wall. This black pigment is like metaphoric of myself or metaphoric of black bodies. And um, I found a mirror and I traced the outline of it, taped up that outline, and just used um, foundation, you know, um, binder, wall paint, and put this pigment on the wall. So uh, this, this picture doesn't do justice, but this material is very, it's like iron oxide. It's simply iron oxide on, on paint. So it has a velvety kind of quality that looks like skin and it looks atmospheric like outer space, like you're looking into, like it sparkles. It's very beautiful material. So it's just this mirror, this body, but what I loved about it was this idea of essentially fixing oneself into space and not being uh, a temporary resident, not being a nomad, not being a refugee in a certain sense, but having a space within this white wall that you can declare or be declared as one's own, like a home. Uh, this is uh, taking off a film, another wall painting I did, again using um, um, media-based imagery and so forth, uh, taking the title off of an Adrian Piper work, and uh, this kind of idea of the mythic African, the mythic being, cinematic. And then I made this, this is a show called, Intermi this is a show called, um, uh, I believe it was called, uh, um, Erotic Invisible Empires, maybe the show it was my first show in uh, Canada, and uh, and I did this wall painting as an intermission piece um, in the space. And for me, I was thinking about this painting um, in this particular way of sort of like a calm respite, a kind of contemplative contemplative space, or thinking about it in in the stationary, and. It's important for me to look at this wall painting of one of my type of paintings in a sense to understand the idea of how I've changed from this view of what painting is from then to now. With this painting, it was meant to be seen from one point in the room, uh, meant to be experienced from one point in the room versus how I like to be able to experience painting 
differently from how I like to be able to experience painting. And um, we'll go through these real quick. This is, uh, again, my process of denying interpretation, working against interpretation. Being able to include the paintings with other objects, photographs, to be able to redefine the context of the work with photographs here as well, the authentic African, with this wall of black paint and eight pigmented uh, rectilinear forms, stripes that refer to skin as well as to my own body. This piece is called body space. And then the canvas work here. So the thing is, what I, what I knew going to Bennington was that this work would be, would be talked about in the, in the same space of Kenneth Nolan and um, Frank Stella and people like this. And this was not the only place I was thinking of, or not the only sources I've had for my, what I was thinking about when I was making my work. There were many different sources from many different places, from many different uh, uh, parts of the world. And I wanted to be able to really create an argument for the work that would not subsume it or flatten it as only color field painting, but to be able to expand it. The work became more landscape oriented. It certainly drew off of the computer, the idea of design space, the idea of like uh, projected space. But they started to become more landscape oriented. And I realized this is my way of dealing with the desire I had for my past or past that I never really fully realized. Because my family left Nigeria during the Biafran War when I was six months old. I was um, raised in America. And I always wished to be able to know what that experience would have been like to have lived somewhere else, to feel a certain sense of home, let's say. And um, that I don't have. But uh, I also know that if I were to go back again, uh, if I were to live my life differently, um, who knows what I would have become. But the desire of wanting to reclaim something that was yours, in a sense, because my parents always said, this is yours, your place. Um, drove me through this uh, experience here. So these paintings are taking off and riffing off of so many different things. Um, television again, test band patterns, the idea of using TV and understanding TV as a means of, 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 of transmitting messages, of, of communicate, a communication box, if you will, and a brainwashing box, if you will. But as they started to get more Figurative, I started to realize that um, that wasn't really the way I, I wanted to go, that that wasn't the thing that I wanted to experience in the painting. I started to realize in my own way, and this is more the painting work becoming figurative and so forth, and having a certain sense of the naturalistic. But I realized for myself, I wanted to be able to get to a place where the understanding and the ambition of the abstraction project becomes a part of what I'm engaged in as well. Not in a sense of how we might understand it fully and solely in a Western sense or Western European sense versus an Eastern European sense or an American sense versus a West European sense, but in a global sense. Being able to understand it in a way that fits the world of things so that it escapes this notions of authenticity that seem to always tarnish how we understand things and rather to be more inclusive in the way that we can merge and bridge and understand how truly ideas permeate through each other. So the work, I was in a project by uh, Gregory Volk called uh, uh, Surface Charge, and there were several artists working on the wall. I had this wall project, which made me realize something, that I can actually become very conceptual in the way that I engage the wall painting. This was the other side of the wall space. I had two walls in this room, and I wanted to deal with how the room was used and activated and worked through. This other space, the other side of the space was uh, the like jail bars and the way it was made with black pigment on the wall. And it really worked with that air conditioner. And then uh, this very tall woman by this door. So this is called the bar bars, and it's the opposite side of the space. And then um, I did this wall painting in one of my shows at the Jack Shaman Gallery. And I got a Davida, again, maybe a way to escape meaning or escape specific meanings that locked down. But um, titled from a band called um, 
my brain is mushed a lot of times. I can't remember these names. But this band, they had this uh, title, this song called In the Garden of Eden, but they couldn't, um, they were out of sorts to be able to remember the words, so they, it became this. Okay. Iron Butterfly. Iron Butterfly. Iron Butterfly. Awesome. Thank you. And Rob Storr saw this, and then he, he selected me for Venice. And from this show onward, I really began to explore uh, potentiality in painting. And for me, what this is all about, really the wall work is all about what can a painting do? It's really just simply that question first and foremost. What can a painting do? And um, here I even have the pigmented arches above that I wanted to, I wanted to make comment to Venice and to the, um, you know, the, 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 the canals and all the boats that we took through there, and the light reflecting off the water. Um, talk about appearance and disappearance, the nature of color, the scale of color, the speed of color, and as well as the certainty of color. So um, it's become a really big exploration from there, and I can become more specific about uh, this when we sit down. But um, for me, when I looked at the Gene Davis show, it reminds me of how much I loved his work. I was, he was somebody I looked at almost religiously while I was an undergrad at, at Ohio State University. And what I loved about his work, what I understand now about the work that I loved back then but I couldn't explain it, was his ability to escape interpretation for it to be able to not really be um, something that you could totally signify and, and, and pin on a wall. That sort of thing about the work is what made it difficult for him to be as established as, say, jo jo Jackson Pollock or, or a Helen Frankenthaler. But I think that's what makes the work still seem as fresh as, as it is now. I mean, Jackson Pollock and Helen Frankenthaler are awesome artists. Uh, Joan Mitchell is awesome. Uh, but there's something about the way that um, uh, Gene Davis um, vibrates still. Uh, it's alive. And it's alive because he was able to understand uh, how to make things. And understand, he understood the artist's voice. And the artist's voice wants to always be free and not be bound by interpretations. And I guess that people like Cle Clement Greenberg, as genius as he was, people like that needed to they had a great, maybe a great, a, a great vision of wanting to define an American type art for the masses. And it was a project that I think was very important, but um, that can kill art. You know, that can kill art. So I'm just going to quickly flip through these and then. Uh, Gene Davis had this spirit that you can see it in also in the show. His spirit, if you look at the work, I mean, he's done so many different kinds of things. I mean, it's like his work has been in so many different types of representations from v light, neon light, to painting on the streets, you know, canvas work, ceramics, I think, maybe knit, knitted work, like knitted, knitted, anything knitted? Light. Certainly, lo certainly looks like light. it. This. But what is it? He worked with light in the tubes. The light in the tubes, but he did some little things the too. Pigment, there were some little right? little things he did. Water. He worked the with micro water. paintings. Those micro paintings. There you can see the weave texture coming through. Yeah. Yeah. So what I think of was really great for, about him, and what I really respond to is his sense of freedom and openness, and being able. He says he he needs to go to the statement you said about going too far into. A, to the work. The aggressivity of his color is something that really is um, um, profound. And yet he escapes um, the violence that could be interpreted in the color by just how the color escapes from where the stripes end, either way, up or down.
That's it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Come okay. over here. Oops. I'm going to take that. Okay, I'll take my Thank you both. Thank you. Um, so I think maybe in the interest of time, I'm going to ask a question or two um, to kind of get the conversation going and then let our audience ask some questions. Um, but since you left us, um, Odelia, and I'm going to this works. Oh. oh, yeah. I, I oh, shortened it. A few more. Okay. Few more. We're going to just zip through those. Oh, there we go. Okay. And I'm going <laughs> to jump ahead a little bit. Okay. Uh, since you left us sort of looking at some of your site specific installations. I thought we'd talk a little bit about this concept of site specificity and immersive installations, which um, I think both of you are sort of moving increasingly towards. We saw that in the For the Love of Gene Davis, which is um, on the slide behind us, and then in your work. And um, I was struck by, by two quotes that I read, by one by each of you. Um, Odili, this statement, color creates space. Color is about space as much as it is about paint. And then you, Polly, saying, it is important to me that people have to move through the works so the spectator activates it and participates in the experience. I'm always working with site, scale, and the architectural setting. Um, this is something that I think even Gene Davis was thinking about. Um, mm -hmm. It is this wonderful quote by Davis about wanting the paintings to engulf the spectator, which I think is an experience we really feel when we're in the exhibition upstairs, particularly looking at those very large scale paintings like Raspberry Icicle. You, you, you feel almost surrounded. And you're kind of replicating this, this experience, sort of engulfing the viewer. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd just sort of let you talk a little bit more, each of you, about um, the importance of that in your practice um, currently. Either one of you, and I'm looking at. Well, um, one of the reasons that brought me to the floor and um, with color is a certain sense of physicality. Mm -hmm. And painting was always up against the wall. And I really wanted people in it, that's what I said, mm -hmm. that it, for me. And um, I love this idea that it's situational and it's also site specific. Mm -hmm. And so it's um, always with a love of architecture, but the idea of feeling a painting, of feeling color, has been, and the kind of physicality and weight of it. I'm always really interested. You know, I was working with very light weight and this idea of lightness, but it also had a presence and scale. It was, it, it could um, compete on the horizontal with, against the vertical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I love that kind of um, back and forth and dialogue between all those different things. And in fact, your, your early work, um, you called fallen paintings, yes, right? The, as absolutely. if they had that literally fallen off the wall onto the floor. And, and then it had a fluidity, mm -hmm. which um, mm -hmm. I've been using that word a lot, but I love the idea of malleable form, mm -hmm. also familiar form. Mm -hmm. fr well, one of our friends said my, my work was form on a vacation. <laughs> so it's uh, in a different world. And so yeah. I, I liked trying to bring all those different things into it, yeah. um, conceptually and physically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was, I was struck also that in many of your early pieces, both titles of the work and bodies of entire bodies of work, the terms you use are really inextricably linked to color field painting. Um, stain, for instance, mm -hmm. a whole body of work that you call stain. Um, a, a terrific piece, which we can see up here, um, called Spill. Um, if I can get back to it. There we go, spill. Um, it was one of the so, early pieces. Yes, very early pieces, in which you're staining directly on. But, but here you can see the way the, the work has kind of fallen to the floor, uh, if you will. Well, I think that one of the things that I didn't um, 
know that much about uh, Gene Davis is he loved to experiment. And I think for me as an artist, experimenting in the making and in the process is as, as important. And so these pieces, you know, they started out one way and then this idea that they can change and they can go out into the world. This piece has been over a bed in an art fair. It's been, you know, over a railing. And this idea of, of form changing in the world and it's of a, a kind of crazy idea, but it's something that I really love, this idea that form is, it's, um, it's ethereal, but it's also changing, it's alive. And I was really interested, I was not interested in set form and monumental form, but you know, I'm working with scale, but I really wanted the kind of familiar, the everyday, the domestic, mm -hmm. into the work. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it was curious because I was working on the floor where, you know, these paintings were supposed to, you weren't really supposed to be, I, Put, put, there is an irreverent, and that's why I said a contrary nature to the work, and that's what started out. And what's interesting is you kind of go in a little the, the kind of, you know, formalism. A friend of mine said the other day, you know, well, what do you think about the F word? And I was like, well, what F word? Feminism, formalism, fuck you, you know? So I love that idea that, you know, we had, you know, we knew what happened to this work, mm -hmm. how it was read. And it was work that we loved, but you know we weren't going to do that work. We were influenced by that work, but really, how did we make it our own and in that world? But the formalism and the Clement Greenbergism is a little scary too, you know, to come into that world. So well, I mean, I, I still believe in the word, but it's like I, under, I want to understand it in the way that probably should have been used or how yeah, it can too. be used in the sense of like, like well, I think of. Formalism is um, it's it's really it's really a conceptual. Mm -hmm. I think of formalism as a very conceptual thing because it's about thinking through forms. Mm -hmm. It's about thinking intelligently through forms and understanding the potentiality and what is involved in all of that. I I don't really and form. See the thing about form is that you know we we can talk about um, how uh, form uh, how in art and Western art we try to work ourselves beyond form. Mm -hmm into the immaterial, the formless. Um, but we can understand that form, and in that sense, we can understand that form entails many different things. It's not just um, art materials mm -hmm. that are standard and commonplace, but what is, what can, what, what, what can we use as material, mm -hmm. you know? Um, we have sculpture students at Tyler School of Art uh, working with video, for example, like, you know, we saw the Nandrin Pike. Is he a video artist, is he a sculptor, or is he an installation artist, for example? I mean, to, to, to be limiting or to limit oneself is when you think about terms and, 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 and applications of terms and ideas and application of ideas, is to really only live and be bound by constructs. And that's the thing that I think I see, I definitely see when I look at Gene Davis or I respond to him, to that within his work, the, the way in which he wants, he wants to escape those constrictive natures in which the work might want to be explained. Absolutely. I listened to that talk mm -hmm. and it was like, okay, one of the speakers said there was a talk that was here mm -hmm. uh, and he talked about the codes, people wanting to get into the color codes. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember that, I laughed when I heard that because that was exactly my feeling when, mm. when I was a student looking at those paintings, I was like, I gotta figure this out. <laughs> what, why is the color doing this? And, and it's really, when I looked at um, the first painting, you, 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 it's called uh, Red, Red Baron. Mm -hmm. I just said to myself, this guy could be, would be the most amazing DJ today. Mm -hmm. How he mixed, it's, it's two pa parts that come together, but the way, he uses a, the way he uses color to fuse the two together, it's like a perfect weaver, or a perfect blender, or a perfect mixer. I mean, it's, it's just like, it's music. And so I see that his appreciation for, when I see that, I think this guy liked a lot of things. He probably loved to eat good food. He probably liked to listen to a lot of great music, which I know he, he did. He loved to just communicate with people. I mean, and I'm just talking about positive things. I know that people who knew him better might have said, oh, I saw him when he was like this or that. For me, it's just somebody that I see that was able to be open to a lot of different things, a lot of different information to be able to do the things he does in those paintings. 
Which is, which is the connection that I see between your work and Davis's, sort of bringing in all of these different sort of cultural, historical, mm -hmm. social influences, mm -hmm. um, which, a as you pointed out at the beginning of your talk, uh, could easily get sort of glossed over, but right. are such an important um, contribution and infusion into the work, and it's what sets it apart, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways from Davis's work as well, um, because, because you are wanting the viewer to sort of, to read into the work, those interpretations. Right. Um, well, I mean, he's dealing with certain aspects too. I think if you look at it, the work, I mean, it's extremely pop. I mean, and it's really way more pop than, than Nolan, and, 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 and in fact, it's closer to Stella in its, in its popness, but it doesn't have, it doesn't, embra it doesn't embrace the industrial in the way that Stella embraces mm -hmm. industrialization mm -hmm. or capitalism mm -hmm. or commerce, right. the way that Stella does, that technological. And you talked about the Golden Family, it was Sam Bacour, who was working with um, um, Morris Lewis and, and Nolan, and the Bacour, his, his, I think his, children married into this golden family. They're, yeah, they're married, it was, it was through marriage. So that, all that information continued into the golden product, which yeah. is a great product. I use, I use them, I love them. But the thing is that Davis's color is extremely pop, extremely hard on one level. Mm. And, and he does experiment, because you see paintings where the color becomes atmospheric. Mm. But you, he, and he does all this strange work, which I was asking you about earlier. I want to know more about that work. But he accepts this certain solidity, this certain kind of materiality, and the openness of it, the blankness of it, let's say. And then, then it just, like as he said, free will and whim, and um, letting it go with the air. And if he would have smelled this or thought that, the color might have been different mm. the next moment. And he understands structure, he understands how to draw because those paintings are held tight. But the pattern, you said it yourself, you said or, how they're ordered and organized because that's, that's the drawing. Mm -hmm. But then the space comes into the color and he says to enter, the quote was here in that lecture, he goes, to enter a painting is to enter through a color. The, door, the, uh, the color is the door to the painting. Mm -hmm. And it's like, ding, that's, like, that's how I understand it myself. Mm -hmm. That's how I've grown, I've grown to understand it myself. Yeah. I like the word you use, potential, because he said, I think he was never bored with the stripes, and he always found different. But there's thick, there's thin, there's different, the width and the structure is different so quality. beautiful. Yeah. And I love, you know, kind of thinking, and, and sometimes when I'm working, I love that idea. It's intuitive, and just say, oh, I'll do that color next. And that he didn't sort of, he planned a little, but he didn't plan that far ahead. Right. And even seeing the ones that are more kind of structured and oriented, but um, they're beautiful paintings. Yeah. They're, they're right. just beautiful paintings. He, un he understands something through, like, I wanted to say, like through a chromophobia, mm -hmm. in the way that, why I, I understood like this, I understand like this, like chromophobia, this is a great, really great book that everybody should read by <laughs> David Batchelor. And uh, I use it for my, with my students. And um, there's this, it's the fear of color, but because of cultural, culturally laced notions that create the fear of color. In the painting, in his paintings, Davis's, there's this aggressivity of a color that speaks, I feel, speaks towards the notion that there's fear of this intensity, mm -hmm. you know, a confrontational relationship to that mm -hmm. intensity. But then the nature in which those stripes are so blank, like a, a Guido Molinari, Canadian mm -hmm. stripe painter, like so blank that that, in a way, balance counters the, the intensity of the color itself and creates this conundrum. You said juxtaposition, or you said something about there's a contract, like you, you Well, I think there's a weight, too, interesting yeah. weights of color, and yeah. also just really rhythm. They're really rhythmic paintings, mm -hmm. and that's, um, I felt a, a beautiful confrontation when I walked in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really, mm -hmm. they're not sissy paintings. No, <laughs> they're no. really strong paintings. No, but I was blown away physically. I had forgotten yeah. about that yeah. weight and presence that yeah, the paintings Yeah, the have. physicality. Light vibrates. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a thing, like, you know, water, air, mm -hmm. color, the, the intensity of it. It's, it's, it's a physical thing, and we respond to it like any other sense that mm -hmm. we have. 
Is that something you strive for in your installations as well, that kind of sort of bright vibration of space? It seems like it, looking at the, the images. Right, with the installations, they're, they're doing a lot of different things with um, the body itself. I'm really trying to think about how um, painting exists in the space with the body near it, next to mm -hmm. it, and with mm -hmm. events happening, like light coming, like I see accidental things all the time, lights coming through the window and hitting the painting and changing it and making it uh, like a, a backdrop to the activity mm -hmm. of light, um, the function of the space itself, and then I'm thinking a lot about just the space of color. If color is this big or if it's that big, mm -hmm. what does it do on the, for the, with the body and with the mind? It's, and I, I, I speak about this a lot in the sense of like, you know, if we smell food, it does something to our body. Then if we see color, it will also do something to our mm -hmm. body in, in so many different ways. Are there questions from the audience at all? Yeah. Yeah. If I may, yeah. Yeah, um, you just said something. I must say that um, I'm from the Caribbean, so mm -hmm. I was happy to say that because I come from a little bit different angle. Um, Anzibia, thank you. Um, you said something that uh, fascinated me, um, and you know, it's a well known idea in the arts, right? This kind of resistance against interpretation. Mm -hmm. Right, because obviously interpretation, you know, one of my I, many backgrounds, but I'm a lawyer and a criminologist, so <laughs> prison, you know, this imprisoning of uh, meaning, this uh, containment uh, of, of meaning, um, especially for people like us who come from the periphery, right, mm -hmm. with all of the, the problems that are inherent in that, the immediate problems that are inherent in that. At the same time, right, I think you, you, you're fully aware of that is that interpretation and interpretation on endless interpretation, right? Uh, in situations and in places, let me just speak about the Caribbean, oh, you, you, you maybe uh, talk about Africa, right? Where people, because of the tremendous changes that have taken place so quickly, right? Islands develop in 10, 15 years what United States took 100 years, 200 years to do, right? The, the, the confusion that comes along with that, right? The, the total confusion that, you know, if you get, what I'm saying, if you get open interpretation, non-interpretation, right? Then there's always a dan potential danger that uh, it can also imprison you in a different way, right? So that um, there's this complexity to have the ability to interpret, right? Without being imprisoned by the interpretation moving forward but still the need to interpret, if you understand what I'm saying, a kind of a open, ongoing, critical, interrogative type of uh, uh, interpretation. And I would like to know, um, in your work, right, using your color schemes, the schemes on the, on the uh, walls and stuff like that, um, do you work with these ideas? Do you bounce off these ideas? Do you think about these ideas? And if you do, um, you know, against this notion of trying to bring in other cultural or the artistic traditions within Western art. Um, how do you see that? Do you, do you see an opening to that? Do you see a closing down at, at, at this point in time in the West against those ideas as they move back to maybe um, a kind of a, you know, stopping? So how do you see these things? Thank you. I, I just want to say, probably start by saying there's always time. I mean, there's always time. We, we, so I used to think like, okay, there's not enough time for things, but there's always time for many different things. I see, I, how can I say to you? Um, really, we have to understand that people come to us and can, not I mean us, I mean everyone, people come to you and they can interpret, they can uh, place a, an idea on you. And that's part of the reality that you have to contend with when you, when you, when you exist, that the way that people see you in as much as you want to understand yourself and how you see yourself and how you want to project yourself. So it's a part of this conversation of, of um, I see, look at it creatively as a part of this conversation of being able to define who you are, to understand that you will have people come at you with an idea of who you might be, but you're not bound by that and that you have the time to be able to reconstruct, construct and reconstruct yourself as you go forward. So the thing is that we 
can, it can be that we might see ourselves set in a particular way that is not of our own doing, but we have the will and agency. If we have the will, if you have the will, you can have the agency and bring it together. You can have the ability to be able to change the way that you're seen or understood by others. So what I'm simply saying is that um, being an artist as I see it is the ability to be able to take action in your own hand and be able to create the world that you might possibly see for yourself. Does that make any sense to you? No, so I mean, uh, one of the problems that I would have with that, if I mean something about it, right, is that that is obviously, if you look after her, even places, right, is that uh, it's some position that to be in to be able to do it, right? Many other people are stuck in positions that they can't do it. So I, I would like to have art that also reaches out to those who may be more stuck, who may be more, have given up on this notion of the agent, how to re-energize them, how to get them to learn to reconstruct themselves. And you know, maybe your paintings um, and the work that I've seen you guys trying to do here might be a way that you know, walking through these things and looking and, you know. But what you're saying is actually very difficult, you know. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not an easy thing. And the art is not, art making is not playing. And it's working. And you have to get to a place for yourself to be able to do a lot of different things. You have to work towards that. But work also entails play. Work also entails celebration. So I think it's a matter of a lot of different things in with what you're saying. Um, we can talk, you're talking about things that speak of um, privilege of access, of uh, being able to have the ability to read and see. I mean, you're going to talk about a lot of things from before you even get to the process of how do we resolve the question of how we're interpreted by others or how we have the possibility of changing interpretation. But, yeah. uh, but I ahead. also think that what's interesting that both of us, what we do is demand people be there mm -hmm. in a presence. And I think that's, um, so the work is experiential. So. If, you can, if we can get them there, mm -hmm. you know, then maybe we can try. And I think in both of us are very open, in interpreta open to interpretation and open, hopefully, seeing the world. So for me, like the picture that I showed that makes me really happy is seeing the children playing in my installation. You know, when I was younger, I thought, oh God, no, I'm not going to be taken seriously. Or engagement. And I think that's, for me, the importance of our museums, education, getting people into. I'm not interested in um, a separation. So for me, it's a journey. I don't know, you know, just kind of trying to open up the doors and bring other people's interpretations in, but also I don't, you know, it's interesting that, you know, I think the term Washington School probably, you know, I don't want to be in a club, you don't want to be in a club. They didn't want to be they in a club. They didn't want to be in a club. So artists don't, we don't want to be members of, of clubs. So, but we do really want people to see our work, to, we're, we're not, you know, it's out there, and, and we need the opportunities, too. I mean, that's, I've, you know, these are, I thank the Lord for the opportunities that I've given. You know, my alma mater, to do something that, you know, this big installation. Um, so I think it's about, you know, a different way of, of hopefully looking and thinking. A desperate optimism. Should we do one more question? Yeah, one more. Uh, more a reflection. You can respond, though, um, for sure. Um, what I'm enjoying about this exhibit and the works you've shown is um, how accessible they are, and it's wonderful to hear discussion of the from the artists about all the thought behind it, all your intentionality and your your pathways to get there. But as a viewer, I'm not up there trying to figure all that out. What I was enjoying when I was up there for the hour before this was watching 
people pose in front of them because they're vibrant or watch a group of teenagers stop and there's about 50 of them that came in and they actually stopped at one of them together and the painting you show or the carpet you show with the children interactive the one you have at the exhibit hall where people are walking that's that's like it's okay to just have pleasure of the viewing and the experience and not really having to go dive deep to think about it. Um, I'm really grateful though that there are people like you who have the training and the intuition to do that deep thought, but just be assured there's a lot of us who are okay with just enjoying it. <laughs> Yeah. I think that's a, that's a <laughs> no. lovely note to end on. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, Polly, and thank you, Odile, thank for you. being thank here you. tonight and, and talking about Gene Davis with <laughs> you.